Guitar Business Radio is the podcast for the business of guitar, where you'll always get no reviews, no demos, and no idle chatter. From players to CEOs and in between, if you have a professional or business connection to the world of guitar, this show is your window to insight and information you won't get anywhere else. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown, and I approve this message. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, welcome to the 67th episode of GBR, the show that doesn't offer you the typical standard interviews that you can get all over the place. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but my goal here has always been to try to do something that hasn't already been done. So thanks for joining us today. Now, in our ongoing quest to bring more players on GBR to talk about their experience on the business side of things, well, we're very pleased to welcome to the show the terrific bassist and singer-songwriter, Tal Wilkenfeld. She's had an amazing career that started as a teenager, and now, 15-plus years later, she's moving on to yet another level. And we'll talk to her in just a moment. But first... Some of you may have noticed that political activity has intensified of late. There's almost no way to escape it except in your own mind. And that, of course, requires a great deal of discipline and focus on something else. Certainly listening to shows like GBR is one way to do that. And with 66 previous shows in the archive, there's plenty to keep your mind occupied. So for those of you who are looking for a good alternative to the political theater that seems to run 24 hours a day... I would recommend Guitar Business Radio episodes 1 through 66. Today, however, we're going to change things up a bit for this show only. You know, we've always been known as an apolitical podcast, but right here and right now, we're going to take a deep dive into the shallow waters of national politics. I think it's time we took a public stand on important issues that matter to you and me and maybe somebody else somewhere. You know, I've been giving a lot of thought to where our country is going and what we're doing to make this a better place for all of us. Of course, that may be an unrealistic goal, but as I've said many times, you have to have a destination, even if it's just a broad generalization that can be interpreted a million different ways depending on your point of view. And as long as enough people agree with us on the big idea, well, we're good, we're in, and then it doesn't matter. Or does it? Well, that's really the question, folks. You see, I think it does matter. And that's where I have a problem with this whole process. Politicians, well, they say the damnedest things, don't they? And it doesn't matter what it really means. The only thing that matters is the end result. And if that sounds a bit cynical, that's okay, because I don't know what that means. But here's what I do know. And today, I'm making the following announcement to all of you and anyone else who's listening. Now, I've looked around and asked, what can I do for this country that hasn't already been done? And so today... After much thought and discussion with my family and friends, advisors, and supporters, I'm announcing that I will not be running for President of the United States as a member of the Democratic Party, or the Republican Party, or the Libertarian Party, Green Party, Birthday Party, or as an Independent. Not going to happen. In addition, I will not be publicly endorsing a presidential candidate or be engaging in any other partisan debate on this show. There's plenty of that going on already. And instead, we'll be taking the high road to positivity world as we come to you every week from the top floor of the GBR studios overlooking water. And on that note, we're just going to move on to something completely different. Well, my very special guest on GBR today is Tull Wilkenfeld. She's been very busy of late with the release of her new album, Love Remains. But the fact is that she's been really busy for the last decade and a half, becoming well-known as a bassist, working with many of the greats in the business, including Jeff Beck and Herbie Hancock Prince, and the list goes on and on. But the truth is that she's been a talented singer-songwriter for a long time, and now it seems quite likely that she'll be known in that realm as well as she moves to her next level. It's another great story on GBR, so let's get to it as Tal Wilkenfeld joins us right here and right now. Hey, Tal, thanks so much for uh, taking the time out of what I know is a really busy schedule right now. Welcome to GBR. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Great, great. Okay, so we have a 
you know, a few traditions here. And, and one of them is we kind of always start off with a uh, what we call a foundational question, which is something like, you know, looking back into your youth, which in your case would be the time prior to getting into the business. You know, what things do you recall that may have impacted or influenced you in such a way that it made a difference as far as getting to where you are today? What can you tell us? Anything at all? Um, I kind of started music relatively late compared to, you know, a lot of my peers. Uh, I, I really just picked up a guitar when I was 14 and, uh, and went from there. And uh, within a couple of years, I moved to the state to pursue a music career. So things sort of really just started happening as a teenager for me. Yeah, I mean, I've li- like I said, I've listened to some of the other interviews you've done. I've read things about you. And, and so uh, was there any particular thing that, you know, inspired you to do that, to, to, to pick the instrument up and, uh, and move in that direction? Was there any kind of... Uh, my, own, uh, my own gut knowing. Yeah. I just walked past the instrument and, and my gut told me to, to pick it up. Yeah. Uh, you, you got into the business, uh, very, very early on. So, you know, because we're a business focused show, you know, I like to talk about some of your specific experiences working in the business in terms of, uh, milestones and and challenges and, and things you learned along the way. I think this is of great interest to our audience. At least I'm told that because most of them are working in the business in one way or another or, or have aspirations. So it's really of, of value. So I thought maybe we could sort of start at the start and understand when you first knew you were in the business as a professional. And maybe we can go from there. I mean, I, I think that you, you have to assess that every single day because this business is filled with uncertainty and uh, the circumstances and the foundation of the business are constantly changing and very rapidly changing with the digital age. Um, so it's not like you reach a certain place in your career where you say, well, I've made it or I'm a professional now. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're fir- in terms of the chronology uh you you started playing and i you know i think i've i've heard some of these stories uh before but you know when you started playing professionally was there a point that you realized uh, that you were in the business for real or was it just just kind of a natural flow of events um i i guess i guess it's natural in in the sense that i i never like woke up one day and said that I'd arrived at some particular point. That's right. just, as I said, things are things are changing every day. So I think it's uh, important to uh, be aware of that walking into the business. Uh, some some personalities really enjoy the uncertainty of it all because it's exciting, and then other personalities don't enjoy that. They like more structure and certainty. So when you started, when you started working early on, was there anything that uh, really stood out, you know, or any uh, important lessons that you think, you know, you learned early on that, uh, that, that were impactful uh, going forward? Anything that stands out? Well, I look back with gratitude, specifically toward the people that mentored me without expecting any return, you know, like... Those people are rare in this world, and I was fortunate enough to meet a number of those people, and early on in my career, too. So I I think uh, I'm not sure what the lesson is in that, (laughs) other than uh, just to say that I'm I'm grateful for the people that have showed me support and educated me in different ways, both about the business and musically. Well, gratitude is a very powerful thing. I, I think we probably would both agree. And I, I'm not sure that I knew that at an early age. It took me a long time to sort of figure that out and a few other things as well. But it's, it seems that you understood that fairly early on. And that's a, a great gift, as well as many other gifts that I can see that you have. Uh, but as you move through that uh, early stage, 
Were there any hiccups along the way? Were there any challenges that you could look back and and feel like you had to address and solve uh, along the way? Anything that stands out? Something that might have seemed like a roadblock or a difficulty in some way? Well, I'd say just every challenge is is also a gift, and it's just how you how you look at it. And if you come at the business with a problem solving mind, you'll find a way through anything with time. And it just takes that kind of a mentality, I guess. I mean, it's also, there's also a lot of luck involved, you know, uh, sure. I, yeah. which is why I, I feel so much gratitude because if I hadn't have met a lot of these key people along the way, I definitely wouldn't be in the position I'm in. Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe I'd be in, in a similar position and somehow it would have happened another way. I mean, I, there's no way for me to tell, uh, obviously, (laughs) but uh, again, like this business is very unpredictable. And so the best that you can do is, uh, work incredibly hard at your, uh, skills or skill set. And I suppose just hope that things work out. (laughs) I don't, I don't really know. It's, um, it's quite a mystery. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'll share with you. And I mean, to anybody who listens to the show is, knows that I do this, but uh, at the end of the show, I, I always end with the same little signature saying, which is basically to, you know, to stay positive and stay focused on your destination, but keep all the options open on how you're going to get there. Very simple thing, but you know, I live my life that way. I run my business that way. And you know, for me, what I, how I explain it, in real simple terms is that, uh, you know, a lot of times, and you've probably seen this too, where people will uh, set up uh, fairly narrow expectations of, um, you know, how they want to get someplace or what they want to accomplish or how something is going to work uh, only to find out that it doesn't. And they haven't uh, allowed themselves the opportunity to take in any other ideas or things like that. But it sounds to me like you kind of have that viewpoint naturally and that you have a vision or at least a, a you know a general vision of kind of what you want to be doing and accomplishing but uh that you've allowed yeah, I guess, you, know, you know the universe to sort of I, deliver I it like right? I, yeah yeah I, I, the only sort of thing i would add to that is like i never actually did focus on a destination um other than, you know, I had this strong drive to make art. And then it became music that I was very interested in. And I didn't quite know what direction it was going. And I knew that, like, okay, so I picked up the guitar and then um, that was of interest to me. And then it sort of switched to the bass. And then after years and years, it kind of went back to... You know, me singing and writing songs, which is just sort of how I started. But I never had, like when I was 14 and picked up the guitar, I didn't think, well, uh, uh, my destination is to be playing to these kind of venues with this kind of an album. And the, like, I, I didn't have any of those details filled out in my head. It was very much sort of following my, my nose. And at the same time, knowing the kind of qualities of things that I wanted to experience. Like uh, I want to be experiencing joy and peace and whatever the the other things that I had on my list were. And that music was the the vehicle. But I think that that keeping an open mind in that way will just allow you to easily shift your direction and not be thrown off at whatever is put on the table for you, like whatever cards you dealt along the way, like you're asking me, like, what are the the various stumbling blocks? And I think if you go into it with this attitude, like, well, anything can happen and I'll adapt. And if I can make something positive of this situation and figure out a way to adapt my skills to this situation or learn the skills, then, then I think things will be a lot easier then like if you fixate on like, well, I have to be <laughs> the bass player yeah. in Jeff Beck's band. And yeah. if I'm not, then I'm not going to be happy. Well, those things never, 
never uh, yield good results. Well, that's the narrow. That's the narrow. <laughs> yeah, that's the narrow expectation. And you've really stated it. You know, uh, when I say destination, uh, you described it. You said joy. You know, peace. What maybe it's just prosperity, or it's health, or 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 something more. You know, more specific. But but yeah, it's it's kind of the bigger thing. You have a sense of what it is, but we don't always know how we're going to do that or what's going to happen. And, you know, it's, it's like you said, best not to get uh, fixated on the hows, you know, on, on how it's going to happen, because most of the time we don't know. And you know, we even if we think we know, yeah, we don't really know. You know? Yeah. So, so, you know, you've got uh, you've really got the right to. Um, at least from my perspective and the way I think uh, you've got the right, the right idea. So I, I would say, and I'm biased, but uh, I would say that that kind of thinking has probably served you very well. Don't you think? I'd say, I'd say so. Yeah. I mean, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to think a different way. So I couldn't tell you, if, you know, and I, 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 I I'm, different way would have... <laughs> I'm so impressed with that because I, and I don't, I don't spend a lot of time dwelling on the past or what might've happened. Doesn't matter, you, you know, but it's really great to hear somebody who really sort of understands that stuff naturally. And, and because I had to learn it uh, after living a, you know, a pretty, a pretty busy life for decades, you know, so I, I, I didn't really get to that point until much later in my life. So like I said, that's, that's really a gift. And it certainly has manifested uh, for you in all these wonderful ways. Um, well, I think that in, in the end of the day, when you look back at your days, whether it's, you know, you're 10 years old and you're looking back at your 10 years or your 20 or your th whatever age you are, and, and you just realize that, like, all the minutia didn't really matter, <laughs> <laughs> and you sort of see what is important, and, and then if you can live your life from that point of view of remembering what's important to you, then uh, you stop sweating the stuff that doesn't ultimately matter. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's I've always, you know, try to tell people and also, you know, myself that, that sometimes we we question whether or not we've, you know, really accomplished a lot or uh, have, have made a difference. And m my sense is that usually is a very short term thing. It's whether, you know, it's like I haven't really accomplished anything in the last few hours. So maybe I'm questioning whether I've done that in my whole life. But, you know, it's always good to look back. And just momentarily uh, calculate from where you've come and all the things that you've done. And, and that's an amazing feeling. And I'm sure it must be for you to look back 10 or 12 years uh, or, or more and see that uh, that pathway it is just must be quite, uh, quite gratifying. Uh, I, I don't pride myself on any kinds of accomplishments other than feeling or experiencing joy and peace because the rest of the things just come and go and you come in with nothing and you leave with nothing. <laughs> so all the That's other right. stuff in that the, in the right. middle That's right. is, um, are, are accessories and, and maybe even possibly distractions. But if you could get to that point of doing something that you absolutely love and that, uh, sharing that with others and, and that gives them a sense of joy, then, then that's uh, a really great place to be. And then to be able to let it all go is, is possibly the greatest accomplishment, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. take it or leave it yeah. and just be, just, just be in the same place. You, uh, you know, I wanted to get into, uh, you know, a few of some of the, uh, some specific things, uh, but I mean, we could talk about this sort of philosophy for a long time and I know I can, but, oh, pro yeah. but probably, <laughs> you know, and maybe that's a, a conversation for another time, but I know. Let's get back to string gauge. Here. <laughs> string gauge. Well, uh, I, I, I wanted to mention, um, Roger. String, string uh, theory gauge. Yeah. I wanted to, uh, yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> uh, I wanted to mention, uh, Roger Sadowski, uh, I, I know that uh, it seemed at one time that you've played uh, his guitars, and we had him on the show uh, not long ago, and uh, and I and I do see the the shot of you playing uh, 
the harmony bass and that sort of thing. So maybe just a little bit about about you know the gear a little bit. I don't do a lot of gear stuff on the on the show, but uh, in fact, I never do. But I'm kind of I'm kind of curious um, in your situation. Well, he's, he's one of the the people that I'm was referring to that you know I met at a, a very young age or when I was really just coming into the scene and uh and he really um really supported me and that's a rare thing like I said in this business and yet I somehow landed upon a lot of very generous kind supportive people and he um really took me under his wing and uh, I played that one blonde Sadowski for, for years and years. It was the, my primary bass that I toured with, you know, anyone from Jeff Beck to Herbie Hancock. I, I recorded on that bass with Prince and countless other sessions. And it, it served me really well. I also um, have a five string bass that, that he made for me that's strung E to C with a high C. Mm. And okay. I use that as a solo instrument like when I just sing with the bass alone because I I could play some chordal stuff a bit higher in the range and I tend to almost play that bass like a a baritone acoustic (laughs) guitar like as if it was a nylon string acoustic but like plugged in and uh, that's that's like that's what Haunted Love which is one of the songs on my album Mm -hmm. is it's that Dowski has a capo on the third fret and uh but in general, this, this new album that I've made called Love Remains, it's, uh, I've worked with uh, a producer named Paul Stacey, and our common goal was to have, I mean, I wouldn't say a vintage sound, but I suppose a timeless sound might be more accurate, not uh, assigning any particular uh, era of music to it, even though a lot of people have said, oh, it reminds me of this era, this era, but it, our intention was to, to not. And so we ended up just use a, using some, you know, quite a lot of vintage instruments and, um, you know, because active basses started at a, a finite point in time. I mean, I suppose electric basses did too, but um, just that there was a broad, broader range with a passive instrument, specifically a P bass that, that worked well for this record and for the songs that I'm writing. I uh, I also used that, that harmony bass on on a song which worked well for one of the songs. And I, I guess what I do now or I mean I've been doing for for quite a lot of years, uh, doing sessions and whatnot, is I just listen to the song and I I see which instrument speaks best for that song. And it could be my Sadowski, or it could be the the P bass, or the harmony, or the EB two, <laughs> or you know, in in the case of my current record, no bass at all on on about two or three of the songs. Mm. You know, yeah. I, I really just have come to do what is best for a song, and not forcing my own ideas onto what I think a song should be, but rather just letting it tell me lots of lots of players these days you know and for and for many years now i mean uh with all of the technology i mean i you know i started playing guitar as a kid in uh, the 60s so you know seen lots and lots of uh developments over the years and uh some players are get really, really into the technology, um, it, you know, in, in a major way, and and others a little bit less so. Uh, to what degree would you say that you focus on that, or, or you know, do you get geeky about any of this stuff at all um, in terms of the tech side? I mean, I suppose to the degree that it isn't a detriment to the skill of making music, right? So. It's, I guess it's all about time management and, you know, if I had all of the time in the world, I'd be making all kinds of custom instruments and, <laughs> you know, but there's only so many hours in the day and my my priority as of now is songwriting. And that's changed through the years. At one point it was bass playing, 
All right. And All right. Uh, it, it could be uh, gardening at one point. <laughs> I, I just don't know. Again, I, I continue to follow my nose and hopefully, uh, yeah, I mean, that, it just, that just is what it is. So uh, I suppose when it, when it came to making this album, I would, uh, I remember going to search for a guitar for the song, One Thing After Another, which is basically just acoustic guitar and voice, uh, a ballad that we ended up overdubbing Woodwinds on. Mm. And uh, me and Paul Stacey went to uh, a guitar store and uh, found what we both considered to be the perfect instrument for this song that we were going to be recording that day. <laughs> so we asked the guitar store, like, hey, do you guys, do you guys mind if, uh, if we just try this instrument out <laughs> and uh, record it on this song and just see how it, how it fits? And, and they knew both of us well enough to, to agree. And I obviously like plopped down my credit card and said, you know, if I return it with any marks that went on it when I took it out, then you can charge me. I knew I would take very good care of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and we recorded it with that, uh, that song with the guitar and, and it was the perfect instrument for this song. And, uh, did you want to tell us what the instrument was? an Epiphone, like an old Epiphone. I actually don't even know <laughs> the exact model uh, of the guitar. But it was a vin- it was a vintage guitar. I'm, I'm that I'm, yeah, I'm that much of a non guitar geek. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm a guitar geek in the sense that I know when something sounds right for a song yeah. or when something feels right under my fingertips. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what really matters. But anyway, yeah. so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so. I, I, I knew that I, I would love to, to own this instrument, but I, I didn't have the funds at the time, so I took it back to the store and I said, yeah, it works out great, but we're not, you know, don't think I could buy it right now, but, you know, maybe in a few months or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And and so some time goes by and I start booking some shows to play some of this material. And at that point, I was like, well, I could really do with that guitar because it was like, that's the guitar that I did that recorded the song on and it's the one that speaks uh, the most. And so I was like, you know, like I, 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 I'm going to call up that music store and, and, and see if they have that guitar still available. And I called them up and they said, oh, we just sold <laughs> just it yesterday. Sold it. Just sold it. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> What? What? <laughs> and uh, sold it to who? And they're like, well, actually, we didn't even really sell it. We just gave it back to the owner. Oh. And I said, oh, really? Oh. Well, who's the who's the owner? And they're like, oh, well, it's it's Ben Harper. No, oh, Ben so Harper. Like, oh, sure. <laughs> that's interesting. I I actually know him. Yeah. And so I, I hung up the phone and I sent Ben an email. And I was like, well, this is, this is a really long story, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm recording with your guitar. <laughs> so, uh, in, in brackets, sorry about that. Um, but you know how it is. And uh, and I really would like to, I sent him a recording of, of the song, This Is Me with Your Guitar. And I, I'd really love to, to buy this guitar now and da 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 and, and, and he wrote back and he's like, Oh my gosh, Tal, I just sold it. So, no. And I said, oh no, uh, is there any way that I can buy it from the person you <laughs> sold it to? And, and he's like, well, let me try to do some magic and I'll get back to you. I'm like, okay. And, uh, and weeks go by and, and I hear nothing. And it's like, uh, okay, well, uh, obviously the guitar is... Uh, is gone and I'll just have to figure something else out. And then I get an email. What's your address? I'm going to send you this guitar. Oh, wow. 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 <laughs> and, um, and so now I play that guitar every show on one thing after another. That's, uh, and, uh, that's and that's the kind of uh, amazing people that I've been very fortunate to, to cross paths with. And, and the, uh, Ben talks about Jackson Brown, who's a, a mutual friend of right. both of ours, and right, right. that we we all call call it guitarma, like because you know Jackson is so generous with 
with guitars and mentoring people and he's mentored me for, for many years and uh, always like lending and giving people instruments and, you know, making things happen for people. So, um, it's, that, uh, that's an interesting, yeah, interesting, con- interesting connection. I don't know Ben Harper, but I certainly know the name well because I, I know uh, Bill Asher pretty well, and and Bill has been on the show, and Bill has worked on a lot of of uh, Ben's. Well, Bill Asher is actually the one that ended up installing a pickup for me in that guitar. Yeah, that makes sense. Enough. That makes a lot of sense. He does that because yeah. I wanted to. Yeah, <laughs> in the studio we just biked it. Um, but when, when it came to going on the road, we, we went to install pickup. So he did that work. And, yeah. He's a local uh, guy, good guy. And, uh, I know he, he knows and is, he's mentioned, uh, uh, Jackson Brown a, a few times. So I don't know whether he's doing any work with him or not, but it sounded like the last time we had him so, on around Christmas time or so. So I have, um, when I recorded corner painter, which is the first song on this album, I, um, I played the song to Jackson on uh, an acoustic guitar that I tuned all the way down to be like mm. baritone tuning. And he suggested I borrow his baritone acoustic to the recording session. And I, I did borrow it and uh, got a little overly excited while recording the song because the band just sounded so great. I had Paul and Jeremy Stacy working on it, Paul producing it and Jeremy Stacy playing drums and, Blake Mills playing guitar, and uh, these guys are just such incredible musicians. And anyway, so we were just getting really into the song, and by the end of that session, I scratched Jackson's guitar oh. under the hole there with my pick oh. without realizing, and I was just dreading showing him this guitar. <laughs> um, but I, I did, and you know, he was very forgiving, and. Uh, then he ended up doing a, a, a secret project with, with Bill Asher of making another one of these guitars that would be specifically for me oh. to, to use on the road and stuff. And so that, that guitar, which they, they sort of broke apart a Yamaha and then put it, a new face on it. And uh, that, that's what my baritone is that I, that I also use live. Wow. Wow. That's, yeah. that's so cool. <laughs> and it's a small world. Isn't yeah. It? And yeah. It's a, there's an amulet system that they've installed, uh, which is this uh, pickup system that, that Jackson uses in, in most of his acoustic guitars. I think I've heard this story and I think it's on, uh, on Bill's interview that he talks a lot about this stuff. And um, it's just an interesting connection because you're at LA based and you know, those guys are all, in in LA, so it's yeah. uh, and we've had a few other a few other folks uh, from the area uh, on as well. But but a couple other things that I just wanted to to touch on, and having a chance to talk with uh, uh, some of the uh, of your management and, and whatnot, and and you've had a lot looks to me like anyway a lot of activity for this new album, and I have to say it's great music. And if I can plug it a little bit, I I, I want to do that because I've listened to uh, most of it. And, um, so, so you've had a lot of, uh, a lot of promotional activity, uh, from what I can see this. And, you know, I was originally going to say that this was kind of the next phase of your career. And I guess in some ways it is, but, but you've been m- moving toward this for a long time. And now you're really doing something, as you say, that's really natural and, and what you want to be doing. And since the album has come out and you've got management and you've got a lot of, a lot of things going on, tell me a little bit about, if you can, about what this whole process has been like in terms of the promotional stuff that you've been doing and, uh, you know, and all of the stuff that goes along with promoting a new album. Uh, what's your experience been with all that? I think my experience is going to be slightly unique in that I've had a previous, well, not a previous, but I have a history of being in the business as a bass player and as a sideman and then made a bit of a left turn for for some people, I suppose, in making this solo album where I'm playing guitar and singing and 
debate is there, but not necessarily the focal point, at least not as much as maybe it was in other situations. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit different uh, if I was just sort of entering the business for the first time and promoting a product because I, I don't have that, that his, that history behind me. Um, and, and uh, so, yeah, I guess it's a bit, it, it's a unique experience in that it's a re-education, I suppose, to some people like saying, well, you know, I, I still do this other thing that, that some people know me for and I'm doing this as well. So yeah, I, I guess that's, my experience yeah and it's and it seems like you've been very busy uh would you describe it that way i mean especially with the album and you know you've done a lot of interviews you've had a lot of uh coverage from what i can see i had a chance to to kind of look at the list of things clippings and stuff like that so there's a lot of of activity and you're going to be uh going out and and uh you know, you have a, a, a tour of, I, I imagine uh, you'll be playing and, and, and promoting the album. And, and so would you say that you're a lot busier than you have been? Um, it's not, not busier than I have been, but busier in a different way. Right. right. Um, you know, uh, uh, when I was touring as a sideman, as a bassist, uh, I kept myself extremely busy, but just not having conversations with media. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I wasn't trying to promote myself as a bass player. Uh, I was simply trying to play bass and uh, grow as a musician. And and I'm still trying to do that as a songwriter, but, you know, it's important to uh, share with people that I'm doing something different now. And, well, that's, yeah. Well, that's the growth. It's just a right? different kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. change happens and... Uh, it's growth and, and you're really moving into something that's probably, you know, going to change the course of things for you, I would imagine. I mean, it, it, you know, it's not that it was hadn't been going fabulous for so many years, but now you've really moved into something that I, I would probably describe as another level. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Well, I mean, that's just how I see it from sort of my perch over here, which is not all that high. But uh, it's just... Uh, you know, it's it's a great story, and I and and the thing is, I mean, you're you're still by from my vantage point, very young. Not that you're a child. That's that's for sure. You've had a, a tremendous career, but you've got a lot ahead of you. I mean, I I would say it that way, and I hope that I do too. But um, you've got a long ways to go, and I I just kind of wanted to hear a little bit, if you can, about what's important to you going forward. And, and with understanding that, you know, you're kind of taking it a day at a time from the big picture standpoint, but are there things that are important to you that um, you hope to pursue or, or include in your life going forward in the near term, long term, anything at all? I am a seeker of truth and I think every human has some sort of conditioning that needs re-educating. And so I do spend quite a lot of time educating myself uh, with, with various philosophies and um, just to continue to broaden my perspective. Uh, otherwise, uh, my songwriting is, is uh, pointless. But you love what you do. Would you describe it that way? I love, I love making music and, and I, I love learning about the world and learning about new things or different people's perspectives on things. It's an endless search, although um, there's only very few absolute truths. <laughs> You're right. You're right. This has been a wonderful opportunity to chat. And, and I, I, you know, I'm just going to tell you that it's a little bit different than, uh, than what I've done in, in the past. And so I'm, somebody that likes different too. And I, I like a lot of diversity on this show. And I remember when uh, one of the first things that Jennifer Batten said to me, and in fact, in the opening of the interview, and she said, well, this is a different kind of podcast. And I, you know, and that was, 
I, I know that she really meant it. And, uh, you know, I always look forward to, uh, you know, having new experiences and, uh, and taking it a day at a time. And, and, uh, you know, I wasn't really quite sure what to expect here, but, but it's best not to have those kinds of expectations. So I really do appreciate you taking the time and, uh, and talking about all of these things that I think are, are personal and important and, and sharing that part of your life with our audience. Oh, great. Well, thanks for having me. Great. I really appreciate it. So what did you think of our interview with Tal Wolkenfeld? We always want to hear from you, and you can do that easily through the official episode page on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Guitar Business. Or you can email us directly at contact at guitarbusinessradio.com and... Of course, if none of that works for you, just call us on our GBR hotline at 888-777-2404. You can do that right now if you like, or later. Operators are currently saving the world, and if you call right now, they may save me from answering the phone. So that was a great interview, and I I have to admit that my talking points were of very little help to me with Tall. And you know... They're always just a framework for the interview, and we'll typically go with the flow of things wherever it goes. But I had to seriously readjust my direction here, and, well, that really turned out to be a good thing for me. You know, it's very easy to get comfortable with the structure of things, and after the interview, as I was editing it, I thought to myself that there were some parts of this interview that really jumped out at me that I hadn't heard on previous shows, and I was reminded that growth is not always comfortable. Getting outside of the cage is not always comfortable, but often, well, that's what it takes. I think it's natural to want to have some consistency and predictability. That can translate to security, peace of mind, or whatever, but that can also lead to stagnation in many forms, which ultimately has its own price tag. So I'll be reminding myself more often to make sure I'm not stuck in the cage of comfort and consistency and venture out to let growth and change happen. And if you should choose that same path, I would encourage you to stay positive, stay focused on your destination, but don't be self-limiting. Keep all the options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week on Episode 68. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com.